Good evening and welcome to uh, the Arizona Deliverance Center in Phoenix. YouTubers, thanks for tuning in. Please do not come here for a visit right now. It is hot out there. And uh, you, what do you mean hot? It's hot every year. It is, yeah, but it's hot for us even out there. It's weird. Things are getting weird around here. So I'm glad you're here. Okay. Uh, our air conditioning is malfunctioning a little bit on that side of the building. Okay. So we told them to fix this side of the building because this is the side where all the saints are. And then on that side is where we have the backsliders. Right. That way. And they get the heat because they're getting them used to it a little early. Well, let's go to the fun part of the seminar tonight. The announcements. Part three, final autonomic processing next Friday right here. Seminar, please don't miss that. Here's all of our teachings on our YouTube teaching channel, youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Kelly pretty much posts everything up there, among other places. Uh, my uh, radio shows here, uh, I've been on the radio for over 20 years. I just expanded my radio ministry. Uh, you go to the home page of the website, click the media button at the top, and then hit streaming radio. You can catch all my radio programs there that are archived. If you'd like to help us financially and you don't have any money, no problem. Just switch over to Good Search from Google and uh, put in Hardcore Christianity, and they'll donate money to us whenever you surf around on the internet. This is superpowered material here. If you know somebody who needs to be delivered and they can't come here for help, no problem. Here is the miracle list. I send out a couple dozen of these every week. They are incredibly effective. However, not too many people actually do the list. Okay, so if you actually do the list, it does work 100% of the time. I have one for mentally ill Christians, and I have them in uh, eight languages. Nine if you include English. There's your deliverance training program if you have any uh, interest in going into this ministry. Don't, most people don't. Uh, but once in a while, somebody feels a call into healing and deliverance. If you do, boy, this is a time saver here. Do you want to know what our future is like? There it is, Seven Churches of Revelation in the bookstore. Uh, Tuesday nights is Julie night around here. <laughs> it's, uh, but the schedule's changing. Is she here? Uh, the schedule's going to be changing on Tuesdays. But anyway, right now, her Zoom service, 6.30 Arizona Pacific time, Tuesday nights for the ladies only. And uh, the... Uh, Meeting is still here at six six thirty, correct? In the in the small sanctuary, uh, the private meeting live. You can be here live, or you can be on Zoom. Okay. <clears throat> Tuesday night six thirty, Wednesday night seven, six o'clock Pacific time. Brother Rick and uh, Stephanie and some of the other hardcore people are on here for your Zoom healing and deliverance service. Send me an email, Mike at Hardcore Christianity. I'll send you the ID and the password. You can download our app if you would like to help us out financially. Or you can donate here. You can put a donation in one of those boxes on the door. Thank you for your help. Summertime, the biggest expense is? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> the expense uh, goes up when that side of the building breaks down. <laughs> and backsliders at this moment are praying that you will put in some donations so we can get that side fixed because they're sweating. There's your do donation button on the website, hardcorechristianity.com. Tomorrow in that sanctuary, air-conditioned, small sanctuary on this side of the room, 
where the saints are, right over there. I'll see you tomorrow at noon. Okay? That's my favorite service of the month because I get to have quality Q&A. And we get time to discuss things, explain things, and so on. See you at noon tomorrow. Those are my radio programs. Uh, I'm on in the morning at 7.30 and in the evening at 7.15. In addition, I just started a new radio ministry on 1100 AM. This is a conservative talk radio station, 1100. But they just started religious programming on Sunday, so I grabbed the 8, 8 a.m. spot. I thought I would take a shot at it. That's worth a try. <laughs> I figured since it was conservative talk, they would have a lot of, you know, some crazy people on there. And then I figured, hey, I'll slide right in. No problem. YouTubers, listen to me carefully. Start an ambush team in your church. I need two or three people at your church to start picking off the sick people. You take them aside privately, get them healed and delivered. I'm going to show you how to do that tomorrow at the training center, a training uh, class in the small sanctuary, which is air conditioned. I wrote these three books on mental illness, Satan, and healing. They're in the bookstore. And don't forget about my Sunday morning podcast. All my friends show up on Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Just go to twitch.tv and put in HCCADC, and there we are. Answer your questions when you type them in, that kind of thing. This thing's going well for me. I'm going to continue to do it. Here's all of our platforms where all of our material is on. Here's some more platforms where Kelly's got us rumbling on. One of them actually is Rumble. So. There it is. We're on that one too. I didn't know that. <clears throat> Our Bible study tonight is I didn't know that. You know, Christianity is a credible religion, so to speak, but it doesn't work very well because there's so much about it that's revealed that people don't know about. And if they did know about it, their entire lives would be completely different. So I thought I would take a minute or two tonight and kind of fill in some of those gaps for you of stuff that uh, you may not have known. You've read this verse many times, haven't you? This is Paul's legendary epistle to the Messianic Jews, Hebrews. This book's so rich, it's, it's hard to describe. But here's the chapter of faith. You've all read it, correct? Yeah. Everybody's read this, this chapter. If you haven't, please read it ASAP. It's quite shocking. Incredible is not, not a way to describe it. But this is the first verse in that chapter. Pistis is the hypostasis of things hoped for. Now let's break that down for a second. Pistis is the Greek word for faith. We've gone over it numerous times here, haven't we? And it means to believe with no doubting and with no unbelief. Pistis, faith in English, means that you believe something and you have zero doubt about it. No doubts, right? And the ability to think like that and believe like that does not come overnight. If it does in a certain area, that's called the gift of faith mentioned in Corinthians. Then it's bang, instantaneous and automatic and works like that. But for the rest of us, we don't have the gift of faith, the gift of healing, gift of faith, or whatever it is. We have to develop our faith like every born again Christian is required to develop it. And you develop it through trial and error. 
trial and error. Nobody has perfect faith after they get saved. If you get saved today, God has dealt to every man and every woman the measure of pistis, faith. Everybody starts out here at the same starting line right there. That? One million Christians hopefully will get saved today, and they all start out right here at this starting line. All of them, one million of them, I'm, I'm, I'm just made that up. Let's assume there was a million. All, one million of them got the same measure. Metron is the Greek word before we get our, it's where the uh, English got the word meter, right? Everybody gets the same measure of pistis to start. There's a starting line, and Paul said it's a race. What happens after the gun goes off is not up to God. It doesn't have anything to do with God. It's all up to you. So, this person is two miles down the track in 10 minutes. This one fell on their fanny and is sitting there two weeks later and crawls an inch forward. That guy's 10 miles down the road. Following? Every person develops their pistis at their own rate. Okay? Some people let the lamp go out. And they do what? They go to that side of the building. They lose their faith. They backslide. They turn their back on God. If they keep going, they turn into an apostate. Uh, back on the road to hell. Backsliders are not on the road to hell. They can be restored in two seconds. Apostates cannot. So, you see people like Smith Wigglesworth way down the road with pistis. And then you see somebody here and not worth a tinker's hoot, as they said in the 1800s. You like the depth of the teaching. Anybody? <laughs> now, pistis applies to every Christian. God is no respecter of persons. Everybody gets the same treatment. Correct? Yeah. God doesn't give up what race you are, what sex you are, nothing. You got the same amount of pistis as everybody else got. What you do with it is 100% up to you. Hello? You can be, if, if you choose and you sacrifice, you can be down there running with Wigglesworth or you can be crawling with this half backslid saint here who's been here two years, falling, stumbling, passing gas, everything, just right here. <laughs> Flopping, falling apart, rolling around, living a failure, failed Christian life. That's your, that's your choice. You choose it, but you all got the same amount to start. Wigglesworth started here. Hymenius started here. Hymenius, Wigglesworth. Are you with me? Now, pistis, believing with no doubts and no unbelief, pure pistis is apostasis, the reality. Of what? Alpizzo. What? What you expect in the future. Hope is always future tense. Okay? I hope to be in glory someday. I'm not there now. You know where I am? 
I'm standing here on this side of the air conditioning. I hope to be in heaven. I hope for a mansion in glory. I hope for all these things. What is hope? It's future tense. My pistis in my, in my future is to me a reality now. I truly believe there are mansions in glory. John 14. I, I believe it. And I don't believe it because I see it, smell it, feel it. Or I believe it with pistis. I believe that, and that's part of my hope. But I'm not there yet. I'm still on my race. Starting line back there, and now I'm down here. See, I'm running my race toward what I hope for. Your faith is the reality of what you hope for in the future. It is what? Elenkos, the proof, the proof of what you cannot blepo, see. I can't see the throne of God. I can't see God. I can't see nothing. I see you, but I mean, no, no offense. I mean, I, well, I can't see heaven, but by faith, pistis, I know it's there. And I know it's my hope. And it's real. Hebrews 11.1, one, one of the great scriptures in the Bible. Boom. This is, a, this is a mic drop moment here. Right? But I got to tell you what you don't know for us to get there. Let's take a look at Brother Abraham, the father of faith. Here he goes. Genesis 22. You know the story. He has a son. He can't have sons. His wife has a son. She can't have sons. Her womb looks like a dried up prune. He's 90 years old. Uh, and how they got their son, thank God, is not in the Bible. Have you ever seen a naked 90 year old man? Okay. <laughs> God leaves stuff out of the Bible and he does it with wisdom. I don't want to see Abraham has the son and the son becomes the most important thing in his entire life. He's dreamed for decades of having a son. Sarah has lived in depression for decades. Why is that? Well, women were under a lot of pressure then. They're not anymore. Nobody wants to have kids now. And, but back in the day, back then, uh, everybody wanted to have kids. It was huge having kids. Kids was a big deal. Kids and a big, bi lots of kids was a bigger deal. Everybody wanted kids and lots of kids. Everybody wanted to ma marry a wife who had an industrial strength womb. Poof, 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 poof. Crank them out, baby. Nowadays, no. That now in the days, they're changing their womb to a, a penis, and they're cutting this off. It's to complete sickness. But back then, back then, women, they, and by the, they knew what a woman was back then. Okay, now now we're, we're struggling. Sarah finally has... The sun, and they are in everybody's in hog heaven. And God takes a look at it and he goes, Hey, wait a minute here. And God's looking at you that way tonight. You, you're getting the same look Abraham got, exactly the same. He's looking at Abraham and he's looking at that kid. And if you go, Wait a minute, this kid is beating my time. I'm starting to wonder if there's something in Abraham's life that he's put above me. And he's looking at you tonight, asking you that question. Is there something in your life, a child, a job, whatever it is, that you're putting above him? No. He scans you and he comes up with red flags. That kid was a red flag. Why? The enormous affection 
Abraham had for that kid was ridiculous. The love was absurd. Absurd. Everything about Abraham's life revolved around this kid. Jehovah noticed that. He said, hey, I got to check this thing out because I already told Abraham that I was going to make a great nation out of him. I already told him that there would be so many of his descendants roaming around, it'd be like a sand on the seashore. I, I got to make sure, I got to make sure here, this guy's on board. God's saying the same thing to you tonight. He's looking at you saying, I got to make sure she's on board. I got to make sure you're on board. And he scanned your life and he saw some red flags in it. Some things that you put above him and over him. He's very concerned about it. Abraham, pack your stuff up. Go on. Go to Mount Oreb. Go on there. Mount Moriah. Make an offering. Tie him up. Lay him on the altar. Kill him. I want him. Abraham, unbelievably, doesn't say a word. Doesn't say a word. Walks up to Isaac. Isaac, my son, I love you. Hey, we're going to take a trip. You want to go on a trip with your dad? I do. Good. Good, Isaac, come with me. We're going on a trip. We're going up to the mountain of God, and we're going we're gonna to make an offering to him there. Jehovah, the eternal God of the universe, the God, the God of gods. Isaac goes, yes, I'm in. I'm all in. Nope, there they go. There they go. He saddles up his ass. He's not talking about, other, he's not talking about relatives. He's talking about a, a donkey. And he says to, takes a couple servants with him. They get up to the mountain. They load up the stuff on the donkeys. They get up to the mountain. Where'd they go? Well, they went right here. Here it is. Here's Bethlehem. And there's Mount Moriah. It's that mountain there, the one in the middle there. There it is there. It's northeast of Jerusalem, right here. See that? Can that is that coming in? It is. Okay. That's where they're going. It's three days, three days away. Three days. You know, it wasn't like Target up the street. This, this was, they had to walk three days to get there. Why? Why did it take three days? Why do some of the trials and temptations you're facing don't last five minutes? Why do they last days, weeks, months, years? Why is that? Why is that? God's giving Abraham a chance to back out of it. He's gone three days, one day camp, two day camp, three day camp, gets up first thing in the morning, three straight days he could have backed out of it. He had every chance to quit. He had every chance to go, whoa, I can't do this. He had every chance to chicken out. He had every chance to let doubt and unbelief seep into him. And he had every chance in the world not to go. And God gave him three straight days. Isn't that funny? There were three days when the Son of God was in the heart of the earth. Isn't that something? That's an odd little coincidence, isn't it? And he goes to Mount Moriah. We found out hundreds of years later how he did this. This is what he was thinking on the three-day trip. We didn't know that until Paul showed it to us. He was thinking that I was going to kill my son and he's going to die, but God's going to resurrect him. Isn't that an interesting thought? Isn't that something that at Mount Calvary, the, the stone rolled away after three days and someone else was resurrected. Mm, isn't that interesting? What a coincidence. And then he makes it to Mount Moriah. They finally get to the top, okay? Now, that's a hundred something year old man here. I mean, this guy's tough, right? Nowadays, a hundred year old guy is going to have trouble walking around Walmart. <laughs> this guy gets up the mountain of God. Hello? And while he's going up there, what he doesn't know while he's facing his darkest trial, 
while he's going through the toughest period of his life, by far. He had some tough stuff with his idiotic relative, Lot, Mr. Moron. He was, Lot was constantly screwing up. He was total trouble all the time. That's all he was, was trouble. He was always bailing him out. That was tough. But nothing was this tough. Climbing up that mountain to build an altar, tie his son down, put him on that altar, and stab him to death. That, that's a bad day. That's a tough day. But unbeknownst to him, Abraham didn't know this, a miracle was coming up the other side of the mountain on the east side. And he knew nothing about it. And neither do you. You're staring at some crappy trials right now. Medical problems, financial problems. But unbeknownst to you, and you didn't know this, right around the corner, there's a check coming in. Right around the corner, there's a miracle coming in. You can't see it. He had no idea. None. There was a ram on the other side of the mountain headed right toward him. See, at the moment your trial starts, Abraham, hey, take him up there. Three days up the mountain. Sacrifice. At the moment he told him to do that, the Holy Ghost found a, a ram. Four days away, headed toward Mount Moriah. He's heading up this side. The rams headed up that side. See, had you only known you had a ram coming, you'd have never griped and complained. You'd have never moaned. You would have never backslid. You would have never filed complaints. You would have never asked God why, 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 why. You wouldn't have done all that had you only known that the moment your trial started, your miracle was headed toward you. The moment it hit. The first day you got sick, the first day the money ran out. The miracle was right over there. I know that. He didn't know it either. God says to him, something to him. He said, hey, he yells at him. Stop! Don't kill that boy. Look over there. I sent your miracle up that side of the mountain the first day you started on your journey. He's coming up. And to meet you at the top. I already explained this to you a couple weeks ago. You know, omniscience, knowledge, is different from experiential knowledge. God knows what you're going to do, but that's not going to help you. He needs to know what you're going to do. The fact that he knows what you're going to do in the future is not going to help him or you at all. He has to know what you're going to do. That's why you have to. To overcome your trial. Because God doesn't know you, even though he knows you. Omniscience isn't going to do us any good. God has to know what you're going to do after he watches you do it. What happened after this? Oh, hey, there's, there's a country called Israel around somewhere. Start right <laughs> oh, here we go. I didn't know that. 
Well, King Saul became a problem, right? He's a backslider. He was, wow, I don't have time to talk about him. He was sick. But Jehovah said, listen, I'm going to replace Saul, okay? When God ordained Saul to be the king of Israel, he already omnisciently knew he was going to fail. What do you do about it? Nothing. When God called you and gave you a measure of faith, God knows omnisciently what's going to happen to you 30 years from now, 40 years from now, because he's God, right? It's called omniscience. I don't know that. I don't have any omniscience. He knows it. Okay? God doesn't handle you based on omniscience. He handles you on based on what you do. So if God calls you here, and he loads you up with gifts here, but omnisciently he sees you're going to backslide down there, he does not stop loading you up with gifts here. <laughs> hey, Brother Mike, you're freaking me out. No, no, I'm not. Future failures are not considered by God. He only handles you as you are now. That's why all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ for you now. Even though you might turn into Adolf Hitler 30 years from now. God doesn't judge your future in your present. He only takes you as you are. See? That's why he gave Billy Graham that song. Come as you are. All right? You don't remember that song? Well, anyway, Billy used to use it on his crusades. Uh, did the a group across the hall suddenly sneak in here? Because I don't. I'm co concerned. Saul's he wiped out, okay? God knew it was going to happen, but he didn't judge Saul based on his future. He only judged on what he did. He went to a witch. That ended it. That was it. As soon as you go into witchcraft, your life will never be the same. You are screwed, lewd, and tattooed. You're finished. Witchcraft's the worst thing you can get involved in. Witchcraft could be avoided at any cost. I want you to go anoint one of Jesse's sons. Samuel says, I'll do it immediately. Boop, they pack up just like Abraham. Bang, they head out to Jesse's place. Jesse says, you're kidding me. Nope, Jehovah. The eternal God told me one of your sons is replacing King Saul. Jesse goes, wow, that's fantastic. I mean, Jesse's a wealthy man, great businessman, uh, extremely intelligent, very successful person. My gosh, one of my kids is going to be a king of Israel. I can't believe it. Oh, he's busting in pride. Couldn't be happier. He said, well, let me bring my kids. He brings the best one first. Shama. And Jehovah goes, no. Well, wait a minute. How about the rest of Britain? They prayed the sons in front of the great prophet Samuel. No, 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 no. Ain't you got any more kids? Is this all you got? Because I was told to come here and I was told one of your sons is replacing King Saul. And he said, well, as an afterthought, yeah, I got, a, I got my son, David. He's the youngest one, but, you know, he's kind of a screw-up. He's got ADD. He's all over the place all the time. 
He's not sweet till we stuck him out with a sheep. That's what we thought of him. He runs his mouth like a busted chainsaw. He gets excited about everything, and we're so tired of hearing about it. Bring that son, boy here, and we're not leaving. And I'm not even sitting down until you bring that kid from the sheep pot right here. Right. Come on. While David is out there, he has no idea. I didn't know that. He has no idea. You have no idea. You're being trained. You're being trained right now for miracles, and you don't have any clue of it at all. All you know about is your current stress, your anxiety, your, your de de depression. Things aren't going well. Oh, if you got a stomach ache. Oh, you got gas. Oh, I got problems. I say, you don't understand. You don't know. You didn't know that. You're being trained. King David got stuck with the sheep. Okay, When you're stuck with sheep, you are officially at the bottom of the barrel. Nobody wants to get stuck with sheep. Have you ever seen sheep? They look stupid. They act stupid. They stink. While he's there, though, some lion comes up. He kicks the crap out of him. A bear comes up. He busts him up. He didn't know. See, and the, and the other brothers were kind of hoping, gosh, can't that bear finish him off? How do you survive that? But what nobody else knew, what King David didn't know, he was being trained for royalty. He was trained to be a warrior. He was trained to be a fighter, a leader. That's why he had to face the lions and the bears. See, God doesn't give you more than you could ever handle. If you can't handle bears, you don't get bears. If you can't handle lions, you don't get lions. But if you can, good for you. God's got something very special, very special for you. The tougher the trial and the harder it is, the greater the victory. David had no idea Samuel was even there. He was out with the sheep. They bring him in. They go, man, this is a sharp, good-looking kid. King David with GQ. <laughs> They bring him back in. There he is. He's beautiful. Good looking. I mean, that's a terrible burden to care. I, I mean, I know. It's tough. Guy, poor guy. Drop dead gorgeous. And the only thing attracted to him is some sheep. <laughs> oh, ugh. Stop. See, you don't understand. You don't know what's going on. You think it's just a trial. You think it's just a trip. You think it's a demonic attack. You don't understand. Before you got attacked by demons, the Holy Ghost had an escape plan already built into the system. Before you got hit. He knows how to read their mind. He knows what they're doing. And he prepares your escape route before they do it. The devil's not omniscient. He's taking shots at you, but he doesn't know he's being spied on. Somebody's watching him. King David had no idea he was being called to royalty. He thought he was going to be stuck with the sheep for another 10 years. He never saw Samuel coming in from the north. He was out there. Sheep. Notice King David wasn't out there doing what modern Christians do. Oh, my God, I can't believe I'm stuck with a sheep. This sucks. I mean, look at, look at me. I, I, my God, I ought to be in a king's palace. I ought to have a bunch of truckloads of concubines like, young son, like my son's going to have. I need a rack of concubines. Man, look at me. He wasn't complaining, griping, moaning, bemoaning. No. He was doing his job. He, God gave him a job to watch a sheep. God was training him to be a warrior and a leader. This is faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
hoped future and the evidence of things not seen. King David comes in, hey, there he is. Jehovah goes, that's the guy. That's the kid right there. That's him. You don't understand. He only said that's him because Samuel was there. See, God already said to you, that's her. That's him. Before anybody else knew it. You've already been called before anybody else knows you're called. Jesse didn't know David had been called. That's why he brought the other brothers up. He was, he was ignorant. Is anybody here going through a tough period? Raise your hand. Anybody at all? Nobody? Oh, there's one, two, three. Good grief. I'm sorry I asked. Uh, now I'm, I'm, dep I'm depressed. I need somebody to lay hands on me. Now listen, several people raised their hand. I'm talking to you tonight. If you didn't raise your hand, okay, this is a nice Bible study. I'm talking to the people that raised their hand right now. You don't know what's coming toward you. You don't know. You feel like you're out in the field with sheep. You feel like you're climbing a mountain. There's nothing there. The top of sorrow and misery. Wrong. On the other side. Miracle coming right up for you. How do you know it's there? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Hoped for. El Fizzo, future tense. You ever heard of this guy? Merabal Meshibazet. You ever heard of him? Phoebe? We call him Phoebe for short, but David's best friend was Jonathan. Jonathan stayed with his dad to the end, faithful, wonderful man of God. They were all killed. And the bad news comes back to the camp. As soon as they heard King Saul and Jonathan were dead, that was the end. Okay? Uh, everybody's running for their lives. It's over. The Jews lost. Well, Jonathan's son, who was in line to be what? <laughs> King of Israel, he was in line to be king of Israel, right? Jonathan next. Should be next. It's all over. He loses everything. Huh? Have you ever lost everything? Yeah. So somebody tries to save his life. She scoops him up. She scoops him up. He's little. They ran for their lives. And then what happened? Well, she dropped him or something. It doesn't exactly say what happened. But anyway, it looks, sounds like he had a bilateral ankle fracture or something. But whatever happened, excuse me, whatever happened, uh, he was, became disabled. Yeah. So this guy's lost everything. Man, you talk about bad luck. He had it all. His, his dad's dead. His granddad's dead. Israel's wiped out. He's lost his inheritance. He lost all of his land. He lost his chance to be king. You, you think you had a bad day, and now he's disabled on top of it. Right? You follow me? Things are not going well for this poor guy. Phoebe's in trouble. But years later, guess what happens? He survives and he moves to a town where nobody wants to live and nobody's going to look for him. Okay? He went to the south side of the tracks. He went to a rat hole city. He went to a place where nobody goes. He went to a place where people trying to hide from the law go. He went to a place that had no prosperity, no nothing. It was a rat hole. And 
he's living there and he got married and he had a son in a wheelchair if they had wheelchairs back there but whatever it was however they carted him around he was permanently totally disabled he couldn't walk anymore and years later King David wants to be kind to him remember he said hey yeah uh, Jonathan's son's around we'll go get him go get the kid they go fetch him in Lodabar, the rat hole, Palestine. And he bring him in and said, King David said, hey, you know, your, your dad and I, we loved each other tight. I was, I was destroyed when he was killed. You're his son. You my guy. I'm going to give you back all your land. If he could have healed him, he would have. I'm going to give you everything back. Right? Remember the story? And you get to live in the king's palace, which is where he would have lived had Saul not been a certified screw-up. He would have been in the king's palace eventually. Well, now he's in the king's palace. He's in King David's palace. And he's living there. Wife and son, they move in. And they're eating at, they're eating at the royal table. Right? You remember the story? <coughs> you could eat at my table. Well, Shivy drops down on his knees. He says, Hey, uh, why in the world would you treat somebody like me? I'm a dead dog. Yeah. You see, if you're going through a hard trial right now and it's been a long one and you're starting to get discouraged, you start. The devil starts to get you to turn on yourself. What's wrong with you? How'd you screw up? You've been you've been you've been secretly sinning. You're not a, you're not worthy of anything. You know you got emotional problems. Or you got a bad attitude. You, there's something wrong with you. God's not coming through for you. You're not going to get your miracle. See, if Abraham had done that halfway up, there wouldn't be any Jews around today. He didn't know that there was a ram following him up on the other side. Shivy didn't know that he had lost everything as a youth and it was all going to be restored here Anybody following this? <laughs> well uh, If you if you live down here in the dumps and there it is it's up by the Sea of Galilee see it there a rat hole city Lodabar it means no pasture land It was hot Deserty the ground stuck the whole place was a rat hole see people move into Lodabar not physically But they load in there mentally They move in Because they start to see themselves as a dead dog And how you see yourself determines where you live the rest of your life Did he say that? How, how you see yourself depends on whether you live in Beverly Hills or Lodabar. Right. He saw himself as a dead dog. Because <laughs> nothing's going right. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Lost my king, lost my dad, lost my granddad, lost my throne. Lost my inheritance, lost my land, lost my health. I lost everything. Unbeknownst to him. I didn't know that. He didn't know that. That on the other side, years later, King David would hunt him down. Bring him home. And give him back everything he lost that he could give him. He couldn't give him back his health. He couldn't give Jonathan and his grandpa back to him, obviously. But he did everything he could and gave him back his life in the palace where he was supposed to be all along. Are you living in Lodabar? Are you down in the dumps? Have you got mind problems? 
I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. Are you like Shivy, kind of a dead dog? Huh? Is that how you think? Oh, man. Really? You read this story several times. It's spectacular, right? There's Naim right here. Jesus is up here in Capernaum, right? And he sees the centurion. Remember that story? That's a pistis story. I had that in my pistis seminar. So the centurion gets this supernatural miracle for his son from Jesus, and it's in Capernaum. He hunts him down in his hometown. That's where Jesus lived. He had moved from Nazareth to Capernaum. And uh, the reason he moved there was transportation issues. You could get right on the Galilee and go anywhere on his evangelistic missions by boat. Well, he gets over here by boat, and then they, then they walk down to Naim, right? And as they're coming into town, some widow, son dies, and she has no other children. Okay, now we got some major problems here. Uh, there was no social services in uh, Israel, and there was no provision made for widows. Okay, so the only provision the Jewish system had was the, the, the firstborn got the bigger chunk of the inheritance. Other, over the other kids. Remember that? And so if, if, if you had widows, the, the older firstborn usually took care of them because they had the bigger chunk of the inheritance and are usually better off financially to help them. But sometimes they didn't have anybody to help them. And uh, this poor woman now is in big trouble. Big trouble. Why? She, her husband's dead, and now her only son is dead. So her two sources of sustenance and revenue and livelihood are now gone. Everything is gone. And the person she loves more than anything on the planet Earth is now dead. Well, in Jewish custom there, we know that you had to be Buried within 24 hours. So the kid must have died when Jesus was in Capernaum, which is 20 miles away, giving the centurion a miracle. She doesn't know. I didn't know that. She doesn't know that he's getting on a boat in Capernaum. She has no idea. While they're preparing the funeral, she didn't know anything about it. They got 24 hours. She's got nothing left anymore. It's over. And the Bible says, what? Jesus arrives just in time. <laughs> As soon as you start going through your trial, at that very moment, your miracle to overcome it has already been sent to you. But you didn't know it. She's clinically depressed. She's sick as she can be. She's groaning in grief and weeping all the way to the Boneyard. And wouldn't you know, just at that moment, how did that happen? Oh, somebody comes to her re rescue. Several people are going with her out to the graveyard. Jesus is coming into Nain while she's leaving it. You ever feel sometimes like you're living in a graveyard? You know, do you live in Lodabar? Yeah, it's tough over there. They're carrying the boy out. 
You know the Holy Ghost timing is always perfect It's amazing how he shows up right there Incredible <laughs> Wow There they they're coming in and they're coming out But she didn't know it. I didn't know that the whole time they were mourning and sick to their stomach and getting him ready for the burial He's boarding a boat in Capernaum 20 something miles away She doesn't know that God knows it. She doesn't know it. She doesn't know it. He's the only son of his mother. She's a widow. There's nobody left a Whole bunch of people were going to escort the kid out to the graveyard to bury him, right? Guess what happened? What happened to you? Years ago, you got compassion. Compassion you didn't deserve. You remember when you used to be living in sin? Oh my gosh, did you ever suck? Wow. I've met with some of you, trust me, you were right. Whew, wow, you just, there's some sick people here. At the time you were living in sin, the Holy Ghost was getting ready to send you somebody. See, while we were yet sinner, Christ died for us. Not after we shaped ourselves up, but while we were living in sin, he come looking for us. He got on the boat at Capernaum, north of Galilee, remember? And then he floats on down. He walks toward Naim. She doesn't know anything about it. I didn't know that. Sometimes mercy hunts you down. It did me years ago. I wasn't even looking for it. I wasn't looking for it. It just knocked on the door. Some people come to God. I didn't. Boom, boom, boom. I just opened the door. Jesus walked up and touched the saurus. A what? A coffin. The kid was in a coffin. And this was over. Newsflash, if you're in a coffin, um, <laughs> Things are not going well for you <laughs> But I'll tell you what no matter what your condition is the Holy Ghost can reach down at the last minute and grab you out of there Neoniscus, what's that that's a young person. I don't know how old the kid was we don't know but he was young That's what, it, what it's saying here He walks up to the coffin. He puts his hands on it. stop that What did he do? Yeah, he woke up. Okay, you're gonna wake up tonight. Uh, listen, if you are going through a trial and you're filing complaints, that trial is gonna extend on and on and on and on and on. Yeah, I took my truck in the other day. The guy goes, ah. Uh, my seat was, you know, the driver's seat. Uh, it was uh, the covering was coming off of it. What do you call that? It's tan, huh? Yeah, the pole, the the uh, it's plastic. What's that? What is that? It's coming off my seat. Vinyl. The co it's coming off the seat. I'm thinking, what? Well, why is that? I mean, I'm not. I mean, I. <laughs> I don't carry a wallet. I mean, I don't have much of a, a booty at all. I'm not heavy. Why is my seat doing that? I take it into the car dealer and I go to the Honda guy he comes out the service advisor Hey, listen now. I want to ask you something My my headlamps on my truck uh, They're getting foggy You ever seen that? What is that called? Oxidation my my uh, things are getting they're you know, they're fogging up Why why is that doing that? I, I didn't do it. I Said I think it's under warranty in it What about the seat the seat the seats just grinding off there? I haven't been hauling around dead bodies and I mean it's just I've just been sitting in it Why is it doing that? I don't know anything about trucks. I don't know anything about cars. It's not my area of expertise 
I don't know what I'm doing. I'm talking to the guy. He says, oh, man, we're going to have to call uh, the Pope and uh, in, the, in the warranty department in New Jersey. Oh, okay, well, you, you know, jeez. I said, okay, well, we'll let you know next week. I'll give you a call. You know, if, I think your warranty might have run out. Well, I get home, and and uh, I talk to the boss. That would... That would be the wife. And um, I says, hey, this is what happened to me at the dealership. I took my seat in. I took my lights. Uh, I took the uh, headlight thing in. They're going to call on and check on it for me. And uh, they want to check on my warranty. She says, when we got that truck, I got the extended warranty, she says. I said, we did? Yeah. She gets up and... Gives me one of those wife looks. Anybody here married? No? Okay, well, it's, it's fine. Don't worry about it. She goes and gets the, the file on the truck. Pulls it out. There's the extended warranty right there. I contact. Hey, I got an extended warranty. I checked with my service advisor at home. <laughs> and... Uh, they ran it through their department, and they said, I've got a, uh, I got an extended warranty. He calls back the next, well, oh, Mr. Smith, how you doing? Good. Uh, you know what? I checked with uh, the bishop in Illinois, and they said, you're covered. I never panicked. I just went home, told the boss what happened. <laughs> I was using my husband pistols. <laughs> the boss flew off the couch. We got an extended warranty on that. Oh, okay. I'm good. I'm good. See, maybe your truck's breaking down in life. You know what? Father's Father's doing stuff you don't know about on the other side of the mountain. And sometimes the devil will give you a call back. Oh, you're warranty. You're covered under your warranty. So I'm going to get my seat fixed and my fogged out lights fixed <laughs> for free. Thank you. Free. Let's see. God hunted you down like the widow of Nain. He come hunting for you. He had the whole thing covered. When I left that lot, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know the Holy Ghost had the warranty in the bag. Hello? So I never got mad at the guy. I said, okay, I'll wait to hear from the Pope. No problem. I drove home. That was it. If you start complaining and griping and panicking, having a panic attack during your trials, your trial just keeps on going. You've been praying for your spouse. Oh, I wish, I wish that person would change this and change that. And then you start griping about it. Oh, my gosh. You, know, you got to live with that person another year like that. Why is that? You complained. You didn't. Now, faith is the substance of things I hope for, future tense. I want my spouse healed. I want my kid healed. I want, my, I want a new job. I need this. I need that. Future tense, hope for, and the evidence of things you can't physically see. Great fear came off ev over everybody. Oh my gosh, a great prophet had visited us. Oh, that was an understatement. Hey, what about this story? You've all read that one. It's a great story, correct? Daniel's in deep distress. He's praying. He's seeking the Lord, right? He went on a, a Daniel fast. Now, he didn't know it was a Daniel fast at that time. We got that revelation later. 
the Daniel fast is uh, has been modified in today's Christianity for example um, You can go on a fast now and just kind of Tell the Lord I'm fasting today. I'm going to smoke only two cigarettes instead of eight I I'm not going to have dessert today. Okay cut that crap out That's not fasting everybody makes fasting to fit their own mood Please do not do that <clears throat> He went on a Daniel fast and he was praying his heart out. Remember that story? He doesn't know what's going on. He's praying and he has no idea what's happening. None. All he's doing is praying. All he's doing is fasting, right? And it and it came what? Uh, three whole weeks. He prayed and fasted. Remember that? What's he doing? He's using pistols. He's praying and he's fasting, but he sees nothing. He's doing it by pistis, by faith. He didn't hear anything. Nothing. Right? That's the essence of pistis. On the 24th day of the month, he's sitting by the Tigris River. Hadekel. Have you ever heard of that river before? Sure you have. It was the river that came out of the Garden of Eden. It's right there. So I don't know this for sure, but I'm just uh, this is kind of just a general opinion. I think the Garden of Eden was right there. See that? Don't send me an email. But the Tigris River, see it runs through here, Turkey to Iraq, over here. So my guess is that Garden of Eden was somewhere up here. Which is where uh, near where Noah landed in the boat, right? Ararat's over here. That's all up in Turkey. Okay, I thought I'd throw that in as an aside. Uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll, I'll throw in bonuses in te these teachings. Pitch in a bonus. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, as you know, the Persians had taken over. Right, and they were running Israel. This used to be Persia up here, all this area, clear down from Israel, all that. And uh, he's sitting by the Tigris River there, praying after he had fasted. Right, and he's praying and fasting. He's believing, but he sees nothing. And suddenly, suddenly he sees this incredible vision. And he was with some other men at the time. They could not see the vision, but somehow, some way. They knew something supernatural was going on and it scared them and they ran for it So this must have been some kind of a dynamic supernatural event of some kind where Daniel saw what was happening, but everybody around him felt what was happening, but didn't see anything They didn't see the vision right and Daniel gets a visitation from an angel and here it is he says to him, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words I'm speaking to you. So stand up. So Daniel is so shaken up by this incredible vision, this supernatural event, he falls on his falls on his face or his knees or something. He said, I've been sent here because of you. I'm sent here to help you. He was speaking to me and I was shaking. I was so excited. I was so fearful, so in awe. Notice this word here is funny. Beloved. Notice that? That's an odd word, isn't it? This is my this is my son. The beloved. That's what Father called Jesus, the beloved. Remember that? A voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Remember that? Peter wanted to go back to tent making. He was trying to put tents up. And God spoke to him, stop that. This is my son, the beloved. It's the Greek word agapao. And did you know in Ephesians chapter 1, that's what God called you? Did you know that? 
Wow. You are his beloved. Same Greek word, agapao. The same word he used to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that story? They were shining bright as the sun. Remember that? Wow, what an event that was. I'd love to have seen that. He said, this, this is my son, beloved. There's another one right there. That guy right there. There's another one right there. There's one. There's my daughter, the beloved. Same Greek word. Yeah, you know what you need to do? Get a new identity. <laughs> you know what? That's what you need to do. You need to get a new identity. You know, if you actually did that, you would actually start to believe the Bible. Nobody actually believes the Bible, but if you had a new identity, there'd be a few people that actually believe the Bible. If you actually saw yourself as God's beloved, right? If you actually saw yourself that way, it'd be easy to believe the Bible. All the promises of God in Christ are, yes, they are, and amen. It's easy to believe if you see yourself as beloved. If you see yourself as a dead dog in Lodabar, you're going to see, oh, I'm unworthy. You know, I'm not that smart. I'm not that, I don't have this. I don't have any of that. I wasn't born here. I'm not this kind of a person. My body's, I'm fat, stupid, and ugly. I'm down. I'm nothing. See, as long as you run that tape through your mind from Satan, and keep running yourself down. You'll stay in Lodabar. You'll die there. They'll bury you there. There'll be nobody at your funeral. Because nobody wants to go to a funeral of some uh, Mickey Mouse gutless Christian who dies with nothing. Who's going to show up to that funeral? Not too many people. A few sympathizers will show up. You know, some people with compassion might pop in. But if you actually saw yourself as God's beloved, like he said... If you actually believed what he said about you, you see the Bible completely di different. Where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst. If you saw yourself as the beloved, that'd be an easy verse to believe. Because I'm not in Lodabar. I'm God's beloved. I don't live in Lodabar. I lived in Lodabar when I was in sin. Yeah, yeah, I was living in Lodabar. I, I, I lived there for 40 years. Brother Mike, that's where I lived in Lodabar. I was a piece of human garbage, soaked in sin. God's beloveds don't live in Lodabar. They're not dead dogs. It's only in their mind. How the heck did Jesus do all those things? He knew exactly who he was. He knew who he was. If you know who you are, then you know what you're entitled to. Jeez. Recently in England, King Charles, is that his name? Just got put on the throne. What is it? Was his name? Is his name Charles? Yeah. <laughs> Charles. Is this, a, a bigger buffoon <laughs> couldn't possibly be sitting on a throne anywhere on the planet. I mean, this guy is a gasping imbecile. <laughs> he's shockingly stupid. I mean, he's like, what? This guy who is, I mean, I ain't got the words to describe him. This guy's so bad. It's unbelievable. He gets up in the morning and he expects people to fetch everything he wants. Literally everything he wants. He expects somebody to dress him. He expects somebody to bring him his food. He expects somebody to clean his clothes. He expects somebody, I don't know, to wipe his fanny when he goes to the bathroom. 
I don't know what he's doing, but he expects to be catered to from morning till night. And this guy is a bag of pun scum. He's one of the worst human beings I've ever seen. Arrogant, imbecilic, stupid. This guy's got the whole package. But he knows who he is. And he gets everything he wants. I'm the king of England. And the king of England gets all these things. Mm. Everybody knows he's a buffoon. Nobody likes him. Nobody likes that guy. When the queen died, everybody was sick to their stomach. Why? They knew Goofy was taking over. But Goofy had the last laugh on everybody. Goofy knows who he is. See, you'd get all your prayers answered and everything would come your way, lock, stock, and barrel, if you knew who you were. <laughs> if King Charles is smart enough to get everything he wants because he knows who he is, how about you? You got the Holy Ghost. He didn't. You are God's beloved. You, you get everything he said you could have. <laughs> oh, am I going through this trial? Hey, you're being trained. The Greek word for tribulation is terazo. It means to test. You're being tested. Why? Because God's a masochist and he wants to see you do something. <laughs> he finds it amusing. No. You're being tested to pass a test to get your degree. When I went to college, I took all kinds of tests to get a degree. Then I took all kinds of other tests to get another degree. You're taking tests to get a degree. You're an, now in a spiritual university, the university of the Holy Ghost, and you are being tested with trials and tribulations so that when you pass those tests, you will move toward your destiny and your anointing and your giftings, what we would call a degree. You're being trained. To fulfill your destiny. <laughs> Daniel goes, what is going on here? Well, guess what was happening? He, did, he didn't know that. You didn't either. Watch this. I was trembling while he was talking to me, and then the angel says to him, from the first day, that would have been 24 days ago, right? From the first day, you set your heart. See that? God was reading his heart. God can read your heart. He knows whether you're cranking out a bunch of word of faith crap. Hallelujah, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not what you're blabbing out. It's what you're believing in here. See, word of faith, word of faith is a false doctrine. That does not work. This works, though. This works 100% of the time. God looked on his heart. He was looking at his heart. He was praying. God went past his prayers here. People pray all kinds of weird stuff. God looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, listening to the prayer. Watching the prayer. God looks on the heart. Daniel's prayers were being heard, but his heart was being examined. I saw you fasting. I took a look at your heart. Your words were heard. <laughs> I came here for your words. Yeah. Is anybody getting this? <laughs> I think you are.
And then the angel says, listen, uh, I need to explain this to you because it sounds weird. I, God heard you the first day you started. And I examined your heart on the first day. Everything was a green light. But somebody else was listening to your prayers in the spirit world. Someone who hates your guts. Somebody else follows you around 24-7. Somebody else is listening to you talk. He listens to you, and he listens to your prayers, and he, when he hears your prayers, he then figures out some method to stop them. And all he has to do is give you a little resistance, and most born-again Christians will just quit like dead dogs. Most born-again Christians will face some adversity and move right back to Lodabar. You need, to, you need to get some kind of Georgia Jefferson Christianity, you know? That, that's what you need, right? You need to move on up to the penthouse, okay? George Jefferson had a revelation about himself. He, he wasn't living in a low-income neighborhood anymore. His business had become successful. He was making money, man. He said, I'm moving. He, what did he do there? He saw himself differently, and he decided to move into the penthouse. Fancy luxury condo apartment. He got rid of the laundry. Laundromats retired. He took his wife with him, but those things happened. But anyway, he goes to the penthouse. Why? Because he saw himself differently. He didn't see himself in a dump anymore at the laundromat. He didn't see that. Moving on up. See? That's what you need to do. You need to start seeing yourself as God's beloved. And just getting your prayers answered by the shovel full. I don't know, Mike. I'm kind of. <laughs> Listen, when you start praying, God sees your heart immediately, heard your words immediately. Here, somebody else heard it and they tried to stop it. Who tried to stop it? Well, this was serious here. This was. The future of the world, the tribulation, the second coming. I mean, Daniel was getting the prophecies nobody else got. Right? right? Top of the line. Prophet of God. No question. And the prince of Persia attacked him to stop him. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. What in the world is that? Holy smoke. Unbelievable. Well, in, as you know, the Persians were idol worshipers. They had gods coming out of their ears. Here's actually carvings of some of them from antiquity. They're really interesting. But anyway, this could have been, this might have been the prince of Persia right there. Who knows? But anyway, this fallen angel or whatever it was put up a fight that was so bad that. Mikael, Michael, Mikael in Hebrew means he that is like God. Apparently, Michael is some top notch angel somewhere, somewhere up there, whatever he's doing. But anyway, he has to show up and fight. Well, had Daniel done been a born again Christian now, he would have. He'd have gone seven days in. Man, I haven't heard anything. You know what? I'm kind of getting, you know, where's the Fruit Loops? Uh, I think yeah, I think I'll quit. I'll just be a 21st century Christian and quit and give up. You know, yeah, I'm a dog. I'm going to move back to Lodabar. But he didn't quit. And what he could not see, I didn't know that. There was a war going on while he was praying. He had no idea what was happening. He did not know 
some fallen angel was trying to block his prayers and stop him. He didn't know that. Abraham didn't know that. King David didn't know that. Help was on the way. He had no idea. As soon as he started praying, he was heard. As soon as he started praying, your heart is examined, right? Exactly. God filters out your prayers by examining your heart. He wants to see if you got selfishness, right? Or self righteousness or some mo hidden motive, something that he scans you through. And if your heart checks out with the prayer, it's yours. But you might have to fight for it. What? I thought the word of faith, I just <laughs> speak it out. No, word of faith crap doesn't work. You may have to persevere. Persevere! Oh, boom, is this thing loaded? You might have to do something. Do something! Cha! It's the last Bible study I'm coming through here. I'm, I'm going back to Lutheran church. You might have to pick your fanny up and get out of your dead. You might have to persevere a little bit. See, his prayer was answered. The answer was yes, because he heard his words and looked at his heart. Everything checked out with God. No problem. No ego, no arrogance, nothing. Sincerity, character. Daniel, top of the line. Fabulous. Answer just like that. Yes. As soon as you start praying, the answer was yes. But you didn't persevere. You start filing complaints. Oh, you start getting you got tired. You start moaning. Oh, I don't know. Self pity set in. Huh? Can't believe it. I can't believe it. You mean I got it? Golly. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't I don't feel very good. I felt better when I was drinking. That's called a relapse. What causes relapses? Pressure, discouragement. You ever been around addicts? Hmm? Nobody? No. That's good. Why well, I've been counseling addicts for years. I mean, I've been I've I've taught at, I don't know, six, seven rehab places all over the valley here over the years. I was a counselor at Teen Challenge for two years. I teach at the Dream Center over there in Grand. I teach over there every week, every other week. I mean, I've been around addicts. What happens to them people after they get out of the rehab? Now they relapse. Why? The demons are waiting for them. They're, they're standing out in the parking lot when they get discharged. <laughs> no, I'm not even joking. They put you in a six months program, sometimes, or some of those nine months rehab, depending on the rehab facility. Varies. And then sometimes, if you're successful here, you can go to an extended program sometimes, might be another three months, six months, something like that. It varies. And the demons are following you right through the program. They, they like rehab programs. And they know, we, they know your discharge date. They got it circled in the, in the bowels of hell. This moron's getting discharged on that date. Okay? So what we're going to do, we're going to hit him on that date. Okay? Okay. Have his wife pick him up. <laughs> yeah, bring the kids. <laughs> yeah. Tell, tell the wife to explain to him he needs, he needs to get a job. A job. Elizabeth, I'm coming home. A job. That's a four letter word. Listen, we got bills to pay. Bills! The kids are sick. Sick! 
the rent's due and I'm two months behind the two months behind. What is it? What does he do? The devil takes a dump on him loads him up with pressure and what happens? Relapse They're set up to relapse Why? Because they don't teach any of this in rehab. Yeah. I teach a spiritual warfare class at the Dream Center. All these men and women, 50 or so every week, sitting there looking at me like I'm, I, I'm from Mars. <laughs> they can't believe it. Some of them are sitting there stunned. I, I did a Bible study there. Uh, three weeks ago, I think it was four, three or four weeks ago, on the on what I've done here several times, the spirit of rejection. Yeah? I explained to them how they ended up at the Dream Center. I explained it to them. I walked them through from childhood to their seat right there in front of me. You should have seen the looks on these people's faces. They could not believe it. They were that shocked. They had no idea the devil had targeted them. As a kid and had been manipulating their lives from childhood all the way up and that they were behind drugs and alcohol they had no idea none they were just sitting there everybody was like speechless they're just staring at me I'm not kidding you I I teach the things on the spirit world there and they're they can't believe it. They've never heard it before They don't know anything about it Hence the chronic failure of the church and rehab programs and everything else in Christianity Nobody understands how the spirit world operates You do now Daniel didn't know what was going on in the spirit world the same thing is going on with you when you pray, when you fast, when you believe, somebody heard you, somebody spotted you, somebody's going to try to stop you. Somebody's going to attack you. And before they do it, your miracle's coming up the other side of the mountain. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord. Not those who file complaints and gripe. <laughs> Self pity. Self pity. Why me? I'm the only person going through this trial. Have you lost your mind? <laughs> 60.8 million people went through the exact same trial you just went through. Hello? This goes on in the spirit world. The spirit world is real. All the guys standing around Daniel ran for their lives. It was real. This is real. You're really being stalked. You're really being listened to. He says, this is what's going on behind the scenes. What is? It's weird. You can tell here Ephesians 6 kind of in the Old Testament. A Rashan Sar. Is a superstar angel. A sar is like a supervisor angel. A malak is a regular angel. So it looks like these supervise these, these supervise those. Ephesians 6 Principalities, powers. In, in Satan's kingdom, there's a hierarchy. In your family, there's a hierarchy, right? The wife. Husband, kids. <laughs> On your family, it's kids, wife, you. Yeah, you in the man cave. Come home from work, go to the man cave, crack a beer, you're done for the night. Okay. There's a hierarchy in a dysfunctional family. I just described it. There's a hierarchy in a regular family. There's a hierarchy in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's a hierarchy in the kingdom of darkness, principalities, powers. There's a hierarchy among angels. Rashon, Sar, Malak.
I think I need to stop throwing those bonuses in. This, this, that one, that didn't go over. All right, look. Several of you people raised your hand. You were, I'm going through a tough period of time. I hear you. I've been through numerous myself. <clears throat> you don't know. You didn't know that. You do now. You do now. Every trial you're facing. There's a miracle coming up the other side. Headed right for you. Headed right for you. What you don't know can kill you. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, just take a second. You're going to get hit. Okay? Why? Mercy. Your trials and your tribulations are the result of God's mercy. He allows it to happen to you. He doesn't do it, but he allows it to happen. Why? Because human beings by nature won't do anything. They like to do something and then stop. They stall. So God's got two choices. Jehovah can leave the heavenly throne. Come down here and visit me. Mike came down here to encourage you. You need to push it. Father came out of heaven here. Okay, stupid. That's not going to happen. God's not going to come down here and give you any encouragement. Okay? What's he going to do? Oh, I'm glad you asked. He's going to allow circumstances in your life to motivate you to change. Why is he doing that? It's not very nice. Oh, on the contrary, it's fantastic. Because you're here and he's taking you here. Huh? Jennifer's sitting there. You can have her autograph in a minute, but <laughs> she sends me an email about this client that I had given her. She's been growing like a weed spiritually, doing a great job with the counseling sessions. And, you know, I may have probably shouldn't have done it, maybe, but I wasn't sure. I took a shot at it. I gave her someone, you know. A tough case, so to speak. She sends me an email. It was a short one. I didn't know anybody could write an email that long, with the exception of Stephanie. Okay, uh, if these two send you an email, uh, park your day, because you won't be going anywhere. But the point of her email, and it was about that long, uh, was. Uh, this was a very complicated case, and she said, I've got a lot to learn. I couldn't have been happier with it. Uh, the length of it was, was not all that exciting. But anyway, that part of it brought me great joy. See that? Yeah. This, this client I gave her pushed her forward in her training and her growth and her knowledge. Okay, it happened to Stephanie today. I gave her a worse case than I gave her. Okay, so uh, human beings by nature stall. Uh, there are exceptions, okay? 
there's Arnold Schwarzeneggers out there who are these super, Tony Robbins, they're, they're out there, these super motivated people who are self-motivated and they get up in the morning and boom, they're out the door, you know, big time. Okay, those are exceptional people. Those are not regular people. I'm talking about regular people. They don't, they won't move. They get bogged down. They get bummed out. They get a little depressed. They get a little down. They kind of remember Lodabar, like Lot's wife. They'll take a look back. They kind of stall. And so God, in his infinite mercy, has to give you a little hope. Okay. There's no temptation, terrazzo, testing, taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, terrazzo, tested above what you're able to bear. Remember that? Mm -hmm. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. Right? But the point of the verse was, you're going to be tested because if you're not, you will never get better. Everybody in athletics knows exactly what I just said. Everyone, doesn't matter what sport you're in. You have to keep facing tougher competition, right? The greatest tennis player that ever lived just got whipped. Did you see that at Wimbledon? Who did he get whipped by? Well, it happens to everybody. He's getting old, and some young buck come up, loaded with skills, beat the guy. Now he's the top dog. Well, you don't get to be the top dog until you lost 50,000 matches. Nobody learns how to win until they first learn how to lose. If you raised your hand earlier, that was a blessing hand. Good for you. If you didn't raise your hand, you'll be getting a blessing soon. Somebody Something, somewhere, somebody's going to test you. And God's going to allow it because he's got big plans for you. Because you are his beloved. And he doesn't want you to sit here. He wants you here. He wants you growing, see? But humans by nature, not every one of them, but most of us, get a little lazy. Sometimes we'll rest on our laurels. Oh, I, I did a good job with that. I think I'll park for a while. You can't park now. The rapture and the tribulation are just a few years away now. This thing's getting close to wrapping up. You only got a few years left. You need to go and go now. You need to make your move. I beg you, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your Reasonable service. Lagakos is a Greek word. It means common sense. It's common sense for you to turn your body over to the Lord. So you used to, you used to use your body for sin, right? Orgasms, sex, truckloads of pizza, overeating, drinking like crazy, taking drugs, going to the spa, having sex, Orgies, porn, masturbation. You used to use your body 
worshiping your God, Satan, here's my body, take my body and use it for your purposes. Sin. Now, God has called you to take your body and make it a reasonable sacrifice, your body. Strap the body down on the altar. Abraham raised his knife. Sacrifice your body to God. Daniel did it. He fasted. He set aside time for prayer. He denied himself. And Jehovah saw it immediately. Boom, just like he sees you. As soon as you pray, bang, he heard it. Instantly. Then he runs a cross check. Is that prayer legit? Or has it got some darkness in it? Has it got greed in it? Has it got selfishness? Has it got revenge in it? Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you'll strike those people down <laughs> so, they'll, so they'll turn to you. Oh, prayer heard. Heart check. Oop, prayer cut. Revenge motive. Loss of prayer. Prayer gone. Out. The devil goes, dang, good Lord's doing my work for me. That one ain't going nowhere. Are you following this? This is happening in the spirit world. I just read it to you. Somebody dying in your family, everything dying in your family. You live in a loader bar coming at you from the Sea of Galilee through the front door of the city of Naim. Somebody's out there waiting for you. You didn't even know it. You didn't know it. It doesn't matter if you don't know it. It's there. It doesn't matter if you don't know it. See, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the reality of it. See, evidence, the proof of things I cannot see. She couldn't see Jesus in Capernaum getting on the boat. <laughs> Daniel couldn't see Michael moving to somewhere over Persia, wherever that is, whatever's going on up there. I have no idea. Something's going on. I know that. Something good for you. He didn't see that fight. He couldn't see it. Faith is a substance. He couldn't see somebody was fighting for him. Yes, somebody's fighting for you. You can't see. I'm being tested. No, you're not. You're being nudged. God's giving you a little nudge, and it's not a crushing nudge. It's never above the, something you can't handle. But he's pushing you out of your comfort zone. Hello? I recently had a counseling session that was kind of unusual. Actually, it was very unusual. Uh, nine, nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, somebody comes to see me. I'm so nice. Oh, so nice. <laughs> nine times out of ten, 99 out of 100, something like that. I don't keep track. Uh, such a nice person. I sit and listen attentively. I hear everything they say. I watch their body language. I see everything they say physically to me. I stare at their face. Oops, that wasn't a good look. There's a better look. I stare at their face. And they speak volumes through their face to me. I watch them, right? People, people speak to you through their face. Number one, through their body, how they sit, how they move. Okay. They speak to you this way. But every once in a while, every once in a while,
I got to yell at somebody. <laughs> You're not a very good counselor. No, no. That's, that's not true. I'm actually a very good counselor. Yeah. Some people, not many, not very many, need to be, <laughs> need some overemphasis. And I've only done it a few times over the years, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40, something like that. But I've seen hundreds and like, I don't know how many people I've seen, thousands. So I don't do it very often, but boy, almost always it's somebody who's a minister. And they've been in ministry so long, they're brainwashed. And ministers are some of the hardest people to help. Um, oh, <sighs> somebody comes to my office and hey, brother Mike, I'm a, I'm a drug addict. You're a drug addict? Really? Have a seat. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> this guy comes in. Yeah, I'm a minister over the church. I go, oh, Jesus. Oh, God, no. Oh, no. A <laughs> minister came to see me because. They're almost impossible to help because they know too much. They, they, uh. Well, this this minister was incredulously and exceptionally spiritually ignorant, and it was scary. Uh, he had he had backslidden numerous times, and on and on. I mean, it was a horror. It was a horror story. And I'm sorry, that that did it. I had. I had to start yelling at him. <laughs> and he just sat there and kind of staring at me, kind of like I stare at my wife sometimes. <laughs> Holy shoot. But, you know, if you go through everything with somebody, patience, kindness, rationale, Logic, scriptures, examples, illustrations. And we put it all out there. And they're not getting it. Hey, hey you know, I'm going to have to go to another zone. I'll start yelling at them. Then I'll add stuff to it. You know, death slap, boom! That's effective. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sometimes I'll start to stand up. And that half stand, oh, that puts the fear of God in you. If I'm real serious, I'll, I'll have the chair close to me. So when I stand, the chair moves. <laughs> Are you really going to? Forty-two years. Yeah, I know. I see the awe on your face. But if it doesn't work, and I took every step I could take, and it does not work, and I yell at them, and it doesn't work. I beg them, and it doesn't work. Whatever I do, I got a range. Oh, my wife's not listening to this. I got a range okay, of skills. And if it doesn't work, and I pray a blessing prayer on them, and I let them go. And that's it. God does the same. If he asks you to change, he gives you the nudge. He gives you another nudge. He gives you another nudge. He sets up a circumstance and you don't respond and you get at some point it stops He'll stop He gave you that chance that one that one Stop and they quit They don't listen anymore and then he says, hey, you know, I love you, but I'm going to have to let you go. There's nothing I can do. 
You're not going to change. You're not going to change how you talk. You're not going to change how you think. You keep saying negative things. You keep, keep having a pity party. You know, I've tried to push you out of your comfort zone. I did everything I could for you. And if you keep saying no, which you do through your behavior, if you don't change, you won't change. It stops. And you miss out on your destiny. You lose your healing. You lose your miracles. They're gone. Because you just wouldn't change. Einstein was very insightful and he had nothing to do with Christianity, right? If you keep doing the same thing over and over again and it's not working and you keep doing it over and over again expecting a different result, you are technically insane. You're insane. You keep doing the same thing over and over again. It doesn't work. 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, it's not working and you haven't changed? It's over. I didn't know that. That's how this works in the spirit world. If you're not going to change, you miss out on your destiny. You lose your healing. You lose your mental health. It's all gone. Some people will not move out of Lodabar. They won't move. They see themselves as a dead dog. They're living in self-pity and their lives are over. They're done. They're beat. What's to be done about it? If you repent, God will crank it back up again. That's all it takes. You got to repent. You got to change. If you change and repent, God will heal you. The Bible guarantees it. <laughs> because you are God's beloved. That's what it says in Ephesians 1. You can read it yourself if you don't believe me. It says it right there. It's the same Greek word, beloved. That's what he called Daniel, beloved. Why? Daniel was listening. He was obeying. Daniel changed. He followed instructions. He did what was right. You can do that now. Can't you? Yeah. All right, let's pray then. Thank you, Jesus.